Hello? Okay. <laughs> First, I just want to say I am so honored to have been invited to speak here. I've always loved the library and the Johnson County Library in particular. I grew up here and, and knew this was an extraordinary library long before I heard about the national awards they had won. And as a taxpayer, I feel like I get more for my tax dollars that go to the library than anything else. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here. So I used to be a microbiologist with a global pharmaceutical company named Merck. And more recently, I taught nutrition education with a natural foods co-op in Lawrence called The Merck. And together, these two Mercks have given me a unique opportunity to recognize what I have now come to believe is the fundamental challenge facing humanity, which if we could find a way to make a difference on, it would positively impact all the major challenges facing our world today. So I'd like to share my story with you. And um, hopefully this will inspire you. sharing my story today is to make the connection for people that I was able to see firsthand myself as well. And I want to start, since this is a writer's conference, with a little bit of foreshadowing here. And I'm going to share this quote from James Madison that I think is very relevant to what I'm going to be sharing with you here today. He says, I believe there are more instances of the abridgment of the freedom of the people by gradual and silent encroachments of those in power than by violent and sudden usurpations. Now when you think about the largest challenges facing our world today, would you agree with me that these five that I've selected are some of the biggest ones? Would you agree they're all pretty important? Now, while these are all... <laughs> While these are all pretty important, none of them are what I consider the fundamental challenge, which I'm going to explain in a little bit. But what if something we've all been taught to do all of our lives from our earliest days turned out to be making all of these things worse and was completely unnecessary to us having a good life? Would you be willing to look into this further? So now let me tell you my story. I was a small child when the death of Kitty Genovese rocked our nation. Kitty was a waitress walking home late one night in New York City through a crowded urban or residential area when she was attacked by a stranger and she screamed for help. Now it's been documented that dozens of people heard her cries over the half an hour that it took before this person killed her. And yet somehow, no help ever came to help Kitty. Now, I was very small when I learned about this, but I heard adults talking about it multiple times through my childhood. And it had a profound effect on the whole country because people were asking, what does this say about us as a nation that something like this could have happened here? For me as a small child hearing this, it had a profound effect. And I vowed that if I ever knew of an injustice or a harm that was happening, and without putting myself in danger, if I might be able to make a difference to that by speaking up, I wanted to make sure I would always be a person who would do so. So that was incident number one for me. Incident number two was when I was learning about the Holocaust. I was about eight years old. And the thing that really stuck in my brain the most about what I learned, I think it stuck there because it challenged my black and white notions of the world at that time. You see, as a small child, or an eight-year-old, I thought that there were good people and there were bad people. And I thought it was a clear demarcation between them, and obviously anybody who'd participate in the Holocaust was a bad person. And so when I learned that many of the prison guards who were known for carrying out the most horrific crimes and violence against children and even babies went home each night and by all accounts 
were normal husbands and fathers. I couldn't wrap my brain around this. It challenged my notions that there was this clear difference between good people and bad people. That was incident number two. Now before, whoops, actually, I was not the only one who was thinking about this idea. It was um, being much discussed in academic circles as well. And many people were trying to understand how people were able to do what they did in the Holocaust. Was there something unique about them, about that culture, or could that be any of us? And one of the most well-known experiments ever done was by Yale psychologist Stanley Milgram. And he designed an experiment where volunteers came in and didn't know what he was really testing. They thought they were in an experiment about learning. And he put them in a situation where they believed they were delivering electric shocks of increasing intensity that could be dangerous to people. And an authority figure was encouraging them to keep doing this even as they saw it was causing harm. And he wanted to know what percent of people would be willing to go all the way and give the highest electric shock that they thought might be dangerous. You know how many did that? In the original experiment, 65%. Now this was repeated different times and places, and the number never went much below 50. But that tells us two things. It tells us, one, that under the right circumstances, around half or more of us are capable of doing things that are, are pretty disturbing. And it also tells us that culture probably plays a role in this because it did vary from place to place. So different cultural values might make people more or less likely to be susceptible to this. Now before I can share incident number three with you, I need to tell you a little bit more about myself. I was a huge animal lover. I was the person in the neighborhood that everybody brought orphaned and injured animals and birds and squirrels and everything to. And I cared for them and, and sometimes successfully rehabilitated them. Also, I saw myself as having less willpower than anybody else I knew. I was a compulsive overeater from my earliest days and often would eat to the point that my head and my stomach hurt and only then would I quit eating. And I knew that every time and I still couldn't stop myself. And two of my favorite foods were barbecued ribs and steak soup. So incident number three, just before I became a teenager, my parents became aware of how the meat they were getting at the grocery store was being injected with chemicals and the animals were being exposed to all kinds of things that they didn't, chemicals they didn't want in the meat they were eating. And at that time, you couldn't walk into the grocery store and buy organic meat. So my parents decided to get a farm down in the Ozarks. They put a herd of cattle on them. And I remember when I sat down to, oh, we used to go down to the farm on weekends and I would watch the mama cows with their babies. And it was obvious there was such a connection between them. A very strong bond, and I loved watching them, and I felt connected to them. And then I remember sitting down to dinner a short time after that, at the family dinner, and somebody announcing that the steak I was cutting into was one of our cows. Now, if you had asked me before this time, I knew that meat came from animals. I knew an animal was killed to make it. But there was something about realizing that I had seen that animal alive and had seen it wasn't, it wasn't an anonymous animal. It was an animal that I recognized had a self and an emotional life and relationships and wanted to live. And it so disturbed me that I vowed I would never eat another cow again. And I didn't, which is quite remarkable given that I, couldn't, I had never shown any ability to control what I ate up until that point. I think love was a big part of it, what enabled me to do that. But I was also a very resourceful child. And it occurred to me, when I saw dead animals on the side of the road, they didn't make me want to eat them. <laughs> that was just gross. And really, when I thought about it, there wasn't much difference between that slab of meat and the roadkill on the side of the road. So every time I saw somebody eating meat, I just thought about the dead skunk I had just seen out on the road. And it kind of turned me off, and I was able to do it. Now, by the time I got to college, I was studying microbiology. And the idea of survival of the fittest had almost become a moral framework for me. I had worked a variety of other jobs at that point that had, I 
been teaching natural history workshops. I taught dissections to younger children. Um, I had done a lot of things that had encouraged me to shut down the feeling part of myself. And I was getting a lot of accolades for this as well and making money from it. So by the time I got to college, I was, whoops, I was fully into this way of thinking. And my education further desensitized me. I was doing dissections on all kinds of different animals. I needed money in college, and I found out about this really cool sounding lab job. And I applied, as did a lot of other students that I considered much better students than myself, and I was chosen for it. And the job had me doing glucose tolerance tests to rats as part of a research study. And I was taught how to cut the tips of the tails off, and I had to, to get the blood, and I had to fast them to try to get them to eat pure glucose so we could get a baseline for our test, and they weren't cooperating. And so we had to fast them longer and longer periods, and I was taking their water away from them. We put the glucose in water to try to force them that way. Nothing was working. And one day when I went walking into the lab room with the rats in it, I saw them all in their individual little boxes. They'd been several days now without food and some period of time without water, and they were just doing this back and forth in their cages, just looking at me as I came in. And I realized not only that I was responsible for causing tremendous suffering to these animals, but that any results we got from this would be completely meaningless because if you stress animals this much, you surely can't use that as a baseline for seeing how they respond to other substances. So I immediately, when I realized this, I went right into the professor who was supervising me, and I explained this all to him. And he sat back in his chair and he said, I know. He said, you're absolutely right. Did I just touch something I shouldn't have? I'll get back there. So he said, you're absolutely right. He said, but you know what? He said, if I don't use up the grant money I've been given, I won't get as much next year. He said, so just go ahead and do the research anyway. It doesn't matter if, if we can't publish it. That was a huge moment for me. And there were other things that happened in that lab, too, that informed my perspective. But it was the only lab I had ever had experience in at that point, an animal lab. But it kind of left me with this idea that anybody who would be willing to do research on animals must either not care much about animals or be a very insensitive person anyway to be able to do that. But I didn't think much about it. It didn't challenge my overall perspective of lab animal research. I just kind of looked at it as what happened there and then. And I quit that job and got out of there and was really glad to do so. Now, there were other things I learned in college, too, from what I was seeing. One of them was I was starting to realize how the industry influences students. And there's many examples of this. I remember I went to an NSTA, National Science Teachers Association, conference a few years ago. And I was quite shocked to see how many special interests were providing free curriculum materials to students and how biased it was in the perspective that it was presenting to them. But of course, the classic example of this is the dairy industry. How many people here still, at this point, believe that dairy products are overall a healthy food for humans? I did too. And you know, when you think about it, where did those ideas come from? Do you know the dairy industry is probably the only industry going back for a hundred years that has had complete access to children from grade school, from kindergarten even, on up, in educating them on their perception of nutrition and nutritional science. And it's rarely ever challenged. And much of what the dairy industry has said, in fact, they were saying before we had the science to actually show if what they were saying was true or not. Well, now we actually have a lot of science. And let me just share with you a few things that we now know. Um, we've all heard that osteoporosis can be prevented by consuming dairy. In fact, the countries around the world with the highest rates of osteoporosis are the very countries with the highest per capita consumption of dairy products. Um, Children with diabetes, type uh, 1 diabetes, did you know that in newly diagnosed children, they have extraordinarily high levels of an antibody that's specific to a protein in cow's milk? And this particular antibody cross-reacts with the pancreas, 
There, is other, there are other lines of evidence suggesting that in children with a genetic predisposition to type 1 diabetes, if they never consume cow's milk, including in utero, if they're never exposed to it, they might never get the disease. But the dairy industry is not sharing this information with anybody. We also know that men with prostate cancer can often slow down and even reverse the disease and cut their prostate-specific antigen by going dairy-free. And we also have quite a bit of published literature showing that asthma, ear infections, and arthritis can be dramatically improved in most people when they eliminate dairy products. So that's just one example. So I was working, I was back in school, working on my master's degree, when I was going more and more in debt, and I found out about what sounded like a great job with Merck that I was well qualified for. And so I went through the interview process for this, there were several hundred people initially in the pool. They weaned it down to a handful of us. I went through the second round of interviews, and I was selected as their top candidate. Then I was flown to company headquarters for a full day of interviews with the top brass. Now, by the time I made it to the final round of interviews, I had the lower-level management who liked me and wanted me as their employee coaching me. And the thing that they told me at this point they said, one of the things we really like about you is we feel like you have been completely honest with us and just yourself. And they said, so that's what we want you to keep doing. They said, don't try to pretend anything else. Don't try to change anything. Just continue being honest and answering the questions, and we think you'll definitely get the job. So that was a really good thing to hear going into the final interviews. So I'd gone through a whole day of interviews. I'd learned more about the position that I was being hired for, that I would be hired for. It was two jobs in one, which was very unusual in the company. Half my job had me working with the scientific department and the other half with the marketing department. So I actually got a more holistic view of the company than any of my other peers that, that were at my level of employment there. And um, I learned that I would be working with lab animal testing facilities, pharmaceutical manufacturing plants, and confinement animal operations with um, poultry and pigs. And I'm, so I'm going through all of this, it's going well, I'm in my last interview with this great, big, handsome, tall, dark-haired man that everybody said was the most intimidating person in the whole company. And we've been talking for two hours, and he finally asks me the final interview question. And he says to me, so tell me what you think about animal rights. Now, this was the early 1990s, and to be honest, I didn't actually know what animal rights was. Um, PETA hadn't been around very long yet, and I hadn't heard about them. I didn't actually hear about them until I got into the industry. And, but I had thought that animal rights had something to do with being an animal lover, which I was, and I had that old experience in the lab where I had thought that was really wrong what happened. So I thought, well, maybe I am an animal rights person, but I didn't really know what it was, and I didn't know that I didn't know. And so I didn't know how to answer the question, because I also had this idea, if I answered it wrong, I wasn't going to get the job. So there was a long silence, and I'm just looking into this man's eyes, and my brain is in overdrive, and I'm thinking, how do I answer this? What do I say? What, do I, what, should, what should I say here? And so I'm just looking into his eyes for the longest time, nothing said. And then finally, he breaks the silence. And he says, never mind. You don't need to answer that question. I just need to know, are you going to be able to do the job? And to that, I could say, yes, I can. And it wasn't until a long time later that I even learned what animal rights was, and it did not just mean animal lover. Um, whoops. OK. So one of the first things I learned after I got into this position was that I was wrong about animal caretakers. 